When I was younger, I used to hear my mother say a lot of times, you don't mess with God's people. God, God ain't going to just let you get away with it when you mess with his people. <laughs> and that's true. That's true. Let me take you back to a particular story. I want to talk about the serpent. Okay. In Genesis chapter three, we read about the serpent that tempted the woman who tempted her husband in the garden of Eden. So let me just simply go here. Verse number one, chapter three. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And I just want to stop right there because I want to talk about some things first. First of all, I, you, you may have heard a lot of times that it was the devil in the garden of Eden. The devil may have had some type of spiritual role with the serpent. And I'm kind of, I don't have much quibble, quibble about that. However, it was not the devil in the garden of Eden. It was a literal, actual snake. Okay. And notice what the scripture says. The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. So notice a serpent. He was included among the animals that God had made beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. So the point is the serpent was not the devil. He was a literal animal. And what we see in the serpent is his ability to speak and to think. So according to all of the creatures that God had made, the serpent was the, do, let me just simply say it this way, and I think you'll get it. He was the head. He was the apex of all the creatures. Mankind was a, uh, was a uh, significant creature that God had made because man was made, only man was made in the image of God. The serpent was not made in the image of God, but nevertheless, as we see his behavior and the things that he was able to do in the garden of Eden, he was clearly the apex of all of these other creatures under man, knowing the serpent knew that he was under man. Cause remember in chapter two, what did God do? God brought all of the creatures before man to see what man would call them and whatever Adam called those creatures, that was the name thereof for that creature. So the serpent knew he was under Adam, which may give us maybe an idea of why he did what he did. But nevertheless, we see being the greatest, and it's just something always about God's most greatest creature always does the worst things of all. You know, notice Satan himself, the greatest creature of God, Ezekiel chapter 28. He did the worst thing of all. He rebelled. Now when we look at the animal kingdom, the greatest creature of all, the serpent of the animal kingdom. What did he do? He acted against God's creation. He rebelled. And then what do we finally see man do? The greatest of all of God's creation in the book of Genesis 1 through 3. What did man do? He rebelled. Always the Top, the head of God's creation always seemed to disappoint God and fail miserably. But let me get back on topic. So the serpent was very much involved in the fall of man. And we see when God came into the picture and began to judge near the end of chapter three, when he judged the serpent, notice he said on your belly, which seems to indicate the serpent was an upright creature of some sort. Maybe had two legs. I don't know, but he was an upright creature. But then notice and on his belly and the dust of the earth, he will eat. So this was the judgment for the serpent and for all of his kind until, until what? We know that one day Jesus will return and make everything right once again. And this is what we call the scriptures call the restoration of all things. This is what some of the, uh, the apostles were referring to in the book of Acts, the restoration of Israel, which will bring about the restoration of the whole world. We call this the millennial kingdom. This will, this will be the second advent of Christ when the world itself will be restored 
from the destruction that took place during the great tribulation. And that's when Jesus talks about the lion and the lamb, the word of God, laying, lying, laying down together and no more um, destruction in the kingdom of Christ. And that's what we're talking about. So, but let me make the point, let me make the point. When all things are restored, and now we're gonna to turn to Isaiah chapter 65, there is something unique that the scripture says. Isaiah 65, in dealing with the issue of the restoration of the world, the millennial kingdom, the reign of Jesus, when peace will come to the world and creation itself will be restored like it was in the Garden of Eden. Watch this verse. In verse number 25, when that time comes, the wolf and the lamb will graze together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. So it says what the wolf and the lamb notice a wolf would normally eat the lamb. No more. There, there is no more predator and prey relationship. There is no more antagonism and destruction and death in the animal kingdom. In that sense, they both are at peace. They lay together. They graze together. Lion eat straw like an ox. We know lion eat other animals, but no longer he eats straw just like an ox. So note the destruction. So there is peace. There is blessedness. But now watch this last part. And dust will be the serpent's food. But notice, although there is a restoration of all things, everything is set back to having peace with God in the natural state that it once was in the Garden of Eden. But when it came to the serpent, his judgment did not change. And the serpent's food will be dust. Or in other words, as my mama used to say, don't mess with God's people because God is going to get you. The fate of the serpent never changes, even in the kingdom, because he calls man to fall. And man is the one whom God has set his affections on. Can I say it one more time? It does not pay to mess with God's people. And don't you make them fall.